Hi, welcome to the problem session for lecture two. We're gonna get right to the examples this time. This lecture is about functions um, and properties of functions and limits. So we're gonna be doing examples relating to those things. So first, we're gonna, we're gonna simplify h of x equals g of f of x with f of x equal to two x cubed minus two and g of x equal to natural log of x squared. What does that mean? Well, uh, this is a function composition. So function composition um, basically sticks in the f into the g. So we end up with the natural log of x squared. The f here, f of x acts as x. So we're going to square the entire f of x right here to get the simplification. There you go. Later on in the next part of the class, we're going to differentiate that kind of thing. But for now, that's all we're doing. Okay. Now we're going, to do, we're going to flip it around here. We're going to do h of x equals f of g of x. What's that? Well, it's the reverse. So now we're going to start off with 2x cubed minus 2 on the outside. And for the x here, we're going to plug in the natural log of x squared. And that's going to be cubed minus 2. Now, that's not the same thing at all as the previous answer, because function composition in general does not commute, as we discussed. Okay. First example. <laughs> um, next one. Simplify this. Well, what's that? Um, it's going to be a squared over b squared, because b to the negative 2 means 1 over b squared. And a times a is a squared. You can pull the exponent of both, because the same exponent, to get this. Note that you can't actually um, do this. If you had, for instance, b to the negative third, then you would have a squared over b cubed, and you couldn't pull out any um, common power. You have to actually have to the same power on both the numerator and the denominator to do this. Okay, so that's this one. Um, for the next example, sometimes I'm going to use examples that were actually from the textbook, because that were worked examples from the textbook. I'm doing this because those are particularly useful examples to have, and I feel like going through them on this problem session can be helpful, even though they're already worked out in pa on you know paper on, on the screen in the PDFs you can get online. So this is one of those examples. We start off with a very... Um, we start off with a model. It's the kind of empirical model you might want to measure. Here at x1 to the beta 1 plus beta 2 x2 plus beta 3 x3. And by the way, I should say, um, we're going to be using Greek letters throughout. There's a table of Greek letters in the first chapter. It's worth your time to become familiar with them. They appear all the time. And you don't want to be, you really don't want to be pausing, not because you're not sure of something, but because you're not sure what the letter is. So it's worth your time to go through and become familiar with, with the lowercase Greek letters. Um, these are betas. At least they're supposed to be betas. I don't draw betas very well. But, um, so the question in this problem in the book is, can you rewrite this by taking the log of both sides and do you end up with a linear or affine function? Well, let's check. Um, log of the left side is natural log of y. Log of the right side is this big thing. In general, you can't do anything with the log of a plus b. So, no, this is not an affine linear function, so this helps us not at all. Um, here's, an here's a different example where you can actually do, it would help us. Let's say y equals alpha times x1 beta 1. Sort of Cobb Douglas type of thing. Um, and log of both sides gives us the log of this thing. So 1, 2, 3. Now, we do know that the log of a times b is log of a plus log of b. So we can immediately do this. Let's do this. Um, log of alpha plus log of x1 beta 1. Sorry, that's x1 to the beta 1. Still bummed I can't erase here. Log of x2 to the beta 2 
plus log of x3 to the beta 3. We also know that log of x to the alpha is equal to alpha times log of x. So finally, we end up with log of alpha plus beta 1 log of x1 plus beta 2 log of x2 plus beta 3 log of x3, and taking log of both sides does help us a lot. Um, why does it help us? Well, look, we have um, we have all the coefficients included in the, what could be regression model, you know, li included linearly in the regression model. And if we change our variables from x to log of x and y to log of y, then we effectively get and sort of this constant, doesn't matter what it is, it could be alpha, it goes to log of alpha, it's fine. We can write this as a standard linear model when we've just changed our variables from x to log of x and so on. Right? And again, we use these two rules, and that's useful because we know how to regress. Um, we know how to analyze a model like this. We don't know as well how to analyze statistically a model like this. So this is a convenient transformation to use to be able to analyze our models. And again, we use these two rules here. And And doesn't matter. All right. Um, so there's an example. There's a couple examples of that. There's one more. Yeah, one more example of that. A little more complicated. If I go a different piece, bit different screen. If this is your example, it's a little more complicated. But really, this is the same thing as x alpha x one beta one x2 beta 2 and x3 to the negative beta 3. So the actual outcome is going to be the same thing as before. Um, except for a minus in front of this last term. Because you're pulling down minus beta 3 instead of beta 3. There you go. So there's a couple examples of that. We will again move on. Um, this one's again from the book. It's a pretty general one. And sometimes the other reason I use questions from the book sometimes are when um, they're kind of open-ended questions that don't necessarily have any obvious single answer. So the solution set just varies. But I'll occasionally choose those to go through in the problem session and then give you example answers. So this one is from the book. It's propose and justify a quadratic utility function as representing the preferences of some political actor over something. So basically, we want to take a utility function, which represents preferences, and we want to use a quadratic function somewhere in there. So um, there's a bunch of possible answers, of course. Here's one, a common one. Here, e is effort. This is So pi e represents the benefit that you get for effort. With pi, the bigger pi is, the more marginal benefit you get for effort. And then you subtract out this quadratic, c e squared, represents a cost function. It's a cost to observing, exerting effort. And costs are often quadratic because, well, there's several reasons for this. Um, one, we tend to think that costs are increasingly more, we, have, we tend to think we have increasing, increasing marginal costs to things. So, you know, buying the first widget to make our product is cheap. Buying the thousandth widget might buy out the entire widget market and might be really expensive. So. Of increasing marginal cost of things, um, practically do, making that assumption allows us to maximize the utility function um, in a nice fashion, which we'll talk about in part um, two of the course, in lecture um, uh, six, I think. Okay, so um, there you go. And again, you can do this. This is a quasi-linear type of utility. So we have a linear t linear term over here, and then a non-linear term over here. There are lots of other examples you could think of. Um, to, if you want to have something like this, where you have a natural log of e, you get decreasing marginal returns to um, benefits because the log looks like this. I'll talk about decreasing marginal returns, and in this case, it's a concave function, and all that stuff in part two of the course. But you get a sense for the shapes of these, these functions. Um, so this would be a function of linear cost, but decreasing marginal returns to the actual thing you're doing in the first place. And you can give various um, combinations of this kind of thing. And this would also produce a maximum. Okay. So some functions. Um, now we're going to move on to the material from chapter 4, the second part of this lecture. 
on continuity and sets and open and closes and so on, limits. So let's start a new screen there. Consider the set from 1 to infinity. Is this open or closed? Well, it's open. Why is it open? Um, it doesn't contain its endpoints, in a sense. Um, if you go the, the limit point um, of 1, the limit of any, of any series as it goes towards 1 would end up leaving the set in the limit. Um, and infinity is an interesting one. It could be open or closed, so it's convenient. Um, it's, is it bounded? Nope. There's an infinity, so it's unbounded. Um, is it compact? Nope. <laughs> um, both because it's not bounded and also because it's not closed. So it's not compact. Is it convex? Yes, because you can draw a line through any two points in the set, and that line is still in the set. Here's a number line. Here's one. Oh, if there's infinity. Any two points I choose in this whole infinite space, every point on this line, every point on this red line connecting these two points is also in the set, so it's also convex. In general, for, for our purposes, a compact set is one that's closed and bounded. So we can think of examples like that. For instance, um, 2, 6, um, that is closed and bounded. So that's a compact set. Snap of that. Um, let's move on to limits. Change color around here. So here is the function fx equals x cubed plus 2x squared minus 4x minus 8. 2x minus 4 as x goes to 2. Now note the denominator is x goes to 2, the denominator goes to 0, but the trick for most of the stuff is to factor. So we're going to factor the numerator. This is a cubic, so it's a little trickier. But we're going to factor the numerator, and you can check to see if it's actually correct, into x plus 2, x minus 2, and x plus 2. I should say that's not, I wrote it pretty quickly. I wrote it quickly because A, I have notes for once, um, and B, because I started by making something that would factor and then multiplying it out to get my original function, so it's not quite fair. Um, in practice, that's how you make up problems whenever you can. You, if certain problems you can make up this way by starting with your answer and then making up the problem. It makes life much easier. You can't always do that, <laughs> but sometimes. Um, but for you, you should expect to be able to just look at this and factor it. You should have to go through and try different things. The hint here for factoring, there's an 8 at the end. So the very last number in all these factors has to multiply to 8. Um, so we don't have that many options. So 4, 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, 8, 1, 1. Right? These are the sort of things you could do. Aren't that many choices. So you can try it out and try different combinations of those things and see if they work. Okay. We know the denominator factors into 2 times x minus 2. We're going to cancel the x minus 2s. I'm going to end up with x plus 2 squared over 2. Now I can take a limit. As x goes to 2, we get 4 um, squared on top divided by 2 equals eight, number 8. So the limit as this thing goes to 2 is 8. Okay, so that's limits. And again, for limits, basically plug a number in first. If, not, if that works, you're done. If it doesn't, try to factor things out and get rid of the denominators that are giving you, get, get rid of the part of the denominators that are giving you trouble by factoring. Okay, um, move on to continuity. Is this continuous on this domain? Nope. Why? Well, as you can see, as x goes to 0, this thing goes to um, infinity. So just like this. Over here, 0, infinity. But as you go negative, right, it goes from negative infinity towards 0, and there's a discontinuity at 0. You're going abruptly from infinity to negative infinity. It's a giant discontinuity. right? Going from infinity to negative, continu negative infinity is a giant discontinuity. However, kind of rhymes. OK, going from 1 to infinity, it is continuous because we're starting here. And from here on, it's completely continuous. There are no jumps. Therefore, it's a continuous function on this domain, but not this domain. Okay. Um, and that is it, I think, that gives you some examples for how to do this stuff. Um, and I hope that's helpful. And I'll see you in problem session for lecture three.